its New Testament part. We cannot rob Israel of its New Testament part two. It is obvious that the Old Testament belongs to Israel, and it is just as obvious that the New Testament also belongs to Israel. There can be neither doubt nor confusion about those two facts. Point one, if those were the only two choices, Old versus New Testament, it would not be difficult to understand why most everyone would conclude they were that described as the new. And most people have never considered a third choice, a new creature, the church, the body of Christ, put in place as a result of the revelation of the mystery given to Paul. The multitudes who know only the two choices, Old versus New Testament, of necessity, conclude that they are the recipients of Israel's covenant promises, old or new. Some teach that today's church replaced Israel, some assert that we have become spiritual Israel, some say that God's physical promises were for old Israel, and we are new Israel and get the spiritual promises, and some actually claim to be literal physical Israel. All are wrong and they all have missed. The Revelation of the Mystery Part of the reason it is so easy to miss the mystery is that so little attention is called to it, while every Bible ever printed emphasizes the existence of the Old and New Testaments. What if you purchased a Bible that had Paul's 13 books printed on a light pastel robin's egg blue paper with dark blue type? With just that simple device, Paul's writings would call themselves to your attention. Similarly, the fact that Jesus' words are printed in red in most Bibles calls attention to them when every word in the Bible is the word of God, and more importantly, the doctrinal truth is that Christ's words in the red letters are not even spoken to us. We already noted that the first 69 chapters of the Bible are not Old Testament and we already noted that the chapters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John before the crucifixion are Old Testament and not New. What we need to learn is that there is a third choice, neither Old nor New Testament, but mystery truth revealed about the body of Christ, in which there is neither Jew nor Greek, hence neither Old nor New. In the four Gospels, the Lord Jesus never informed the apostles that uncircumcised Gentiles ever would be cleansed. Nor was the sanctification of uncircumcised Gentiles the subject of any prophecy. Instead, even during the early portion of the book of Acts, Peter's understanding was that only Israel would receive the Lord's blessing directly, and that the nations of the earth would be blessed through Israel's exaltation. After the cross, after Pentecost, Peter maintained that Gentiles were to be blessed through the rise of Israel according to Israel's covenants, Acts 3 verse 25, Ye are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. And so, Peter, with the keys of the kingdom in hand and the Holy Ghost upon him had not moved an inch from Genesis 26 verse 4, and I will make thy seed too. Multiply as the stars of heaven and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis 28 verse 14, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Peter continued to preach the seed, plural, nation Israel, not knowing of the seed, singular, he saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Galatians 3 verse 16, which is Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Since Peter would have nothing to do with a Gentile as late as Acts chapter 10, for people and denominations to put Gentiles in Acts chapter 2 is intellectually dishonest, Acts 10 verse 28, and he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company, or come unto one of another nation. Then neither were uncircumcised Gentiles to be included in any of his other early Acts sermons. In fact, Peter's understanding that Christ was a savior only to Israel also is reflected by his answer to the Jewish high priest, Acts 5 verses 30 to 31, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel. What this means is that after the cross, Israel's New Testament could begin, and so it had. What we read in each of the four Gospels and in the early part of the Book of Acts is still about Israel and Israel's kingdom, with Gentiles still as outcasts unless they proselytize into the nation Israel. And proselytize into the nation Israel was what Cornelius did in Acts chapter 10. It was in the 10th chapter of Acts that the Lord sent Peter a vision of a great sheet let down to the earth, filled with unclean beasts, in order to prepare Peter for his encounter with uncircumcised Gentiles. Peter, though, initially refused these unclean beasts. 
Acts 10 verses 10 to 15, And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance, and saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice speak unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Up to this point, Peter and the other apostles had continued keeping the law, having never been taught otherwise. In the vision, the Gentiles were represented by the unclean beasts, and the law forbade the Jews from eating the unclean beasts. Point two. Although Cornelius feared God and gave alms to the nation of Israel, he was still an uncircumcised Gentile. Since the Jews were required to remain separate from the nations, Peter therefore considered all uncircumcised men such as Cornelius to be unclean until the Lord himself made it clear that they had been cleansed and could join with Peter. Acts 10 verse 28, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation, but God hath shewed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Peter came to this realization when Cornelius spoke in tongues, since tongues were signs for unbelieving Jews. 3 Peter was the unbelieving Jew who learned Cornelius was acceptable by the sign of tongues. In understanding this, we are then able to gain even more clarity when we realize that Peter made no mention of Paul or Paul's gospel of the grace of God in dealing with Cornelius. Cornelius, like the Canaanite woman and the Roman centurion, was blessed because he had blessed the nation Israel. Cornelius was not blessed by Israel's fall, which means that Cornelius is not a pattern of Gentile salvation into the body of Christ today. Peter would stay with his kingdom message for Israel, knowing to welcome Gentiles such as Cornelius. Paul would stay with his message of grace salvation to Israel and Gentiles without distinction. Peter and Paul would separate and go their own ways, for national Israel was declared fallen and Paul's message continues to this very day, with people still saying, you robbed Peter to pay Paul. When Peter and his followers died, any hope for Israel, temporarily, died with them. Some confusion is engendered in Acts chapter 6 when the Grecians are mentioned for the first time. Although it would be natural to assume that the Grecians were Gentiles, it would be wrong. We have seen, based upon Acts chapter 10 and Cornelius, that Peter could not have been preaching to Gentiles at Pentecost. This also would be true for the sixth chapter of Acts, and all we know from the fact that these people are called Grecians is that they were from Greece. Even as late as Acts chapter 11, the disciples, who were scattered abroad after Stephen was stoned in Acts chapter 7, were still preaching the word to the Jews only. Acts 11 verse 19, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenis and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. What all this shows is that after the cross, including Pentecost and the early Acts period, we read about the kingdom actually being offered to Israel for the first time. While the kingdom was the focus of the four Gospels, the kingdom could not be offered until the sacrifice of the Messiah had taken place. Point five. We cannot rob Israel of these New Testament chapters which follow the cross. We can, however, recognize that national Israel fails and falls. Acts 7 verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Romans 11 verses 26 to 28, And so, all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Shaun the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Fathers sakes. And so, Israel's national salvation is yet future and will occur when Christ returns as their deliverer. The New Testament covenants are still for them, not for us. Mixing Peter with Paul and confusing their separate and different messages is to rob Israel of its New Testament, and we will not do that because we have learned to rightly divide the word of truth. One. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 33 Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, 
which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Hebrews 8 verses 8 to 10 For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, 2. Leviticus 11 verse 2 Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Leviticus 11 verse 4 Nevertheless these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. 3. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 22 Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22 For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. 4. Galatians 2 verse 9 And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. 5. Matthew 26 verse 28 For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. We must recognize that the prophecy program has been interrupted. It is common in malls and large hotels and theme parks to have a map kiosk with an arrow or an X which declares you are here. Suppose some pranksters were to sneak in after closing and move every map to a wrong location so that when you read you are here you never were there? You might be a very long time getting to where you needed to be. Good directions work to our great advantage, but woe unto us when the directions are wrong. We were misdirected when we purchased a Bible and that only the Old and New Testaments were identified and misidentified at that. As we have noted already, the Old Testament does not begin until 69 chapters past where the Bible marks it off at the beginning of Genesis. Similarly, the New Testament cannot begin until the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so, we are misled in these most rudimentary elements. We also are misdirected by having the Lord's earthly ministry to Israel printed in red letters, emphasizing one portion of God's word over another by the color of the ink rather than by the shades of the doctrine. We were misdirected when we were taught to memorize the books of the Old Testament, putting it in our minds that the four Gospels are New Testament in doctrine when they are not. Compounding the confusion, we then memorized the 27 books of the New Testament giving no regard whatsoever to the Pauline revelation of the mystery. And it turns out that the most important thing we can get right in our Bible study is to distinguish the differences between and the separation of the prophecy and mystery programs found in Scripture. The Bible clearly declares the presence of mystery information made known to Paul, information which was unknown before Christ imparted it to the Apostle to the Gentiles. Romans 16 verse 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Ephesians 3 verses 2 to 3, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you ward, 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, Colossians 1 verse 26, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, since the Pauline mystery had been kept secret. It then would be wrong to think that it is the same as the mysteries of the kingdom, which were composed of information which the Lord taught Messianic believers in parables, Matthew 13 verse 11, He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. It was no mystery that the Lord some day would scatter the children of Israel, due to their disobedience and unbelief. Nor was it a mystery that God temporarily would forsake the nation of Israel, prior to the establishment of his prophesied kingdom. 
Indeed, the Lord's temporary forsaking of Israel was clearly prophesied, Isaiah 54 verses 6 to 8, For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. The interruption of the promises of prophecy is obvious and affirmed by Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry as the Lord read Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 2, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, the Lord Jesus Christ, being the author of dispensationalism, did not read the two verses in their entirety. Rather, the Lord stopped and closed the book without reading about the day of vengeance. As Isaiah wrote those two verses, there is no provision for the revelation of the mystery and the imposition of what has been nearly 2,000 years of the unprophesied dispensation of the grace of God. When the Lord Jesus read those same verses, clearly, he knew the revelation of the mystery was soon to come, although Christ himself did not declare it during his earthly ministry. Luke 4 verses 16 to 21, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. The Lord closed the book and did not read about the prophecies which were not going to happen at that time. Since Christ knew the end from the beginning, he knew the revelation of the mystery was going to interrupt the prophetic program, and he expects us to understand that as well. Another example demonstrating the interruption of the prophetic program by the revelation of the mystery happened on the day of Pentecost. Peter quoted Joel's prophecy, Acts 2 verses 16 to 21, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will shew wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood, and fire, and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come, and it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Under the Pentecostal power and anointing of the Holy Ghost, Peter preached Joel's prophecy for Israel's time of tribulation, but most of what Peter preached did not all happen, the prophetic program was interrupted. Joel 2 verses 28 to 31, And it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also, upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will shew wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, and fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. The prophecy program was interrupted before the sun was turned into darkness and the moon into blood. The Lord Jesus Christ himself did the interrupting when Christ revealed the mystery to our apostle, Paul. Ephesians 3 verses 2 and 3, 5, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, Lord, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, examples abound it is clear that the prophetic program was to be interrupted. The Lord taught that there would be a delay in many of his parables. Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9 awaits the confirmation of the covenant. There are no apostles seated upon any thrones anywhere ruling and reigning with Christ. There is no peace in Jerusalem or anywhere else much. 
Rather than the completion of the prophetic program, there has been an interruption for the dispensation of grace, a time during which no prophecy is being fulfilled, but rather a mystery is being revealed. Clearly, prophecy has been interrupted by the revelation of the mystery, and you are here in this, the dispensation of God's grace. Rather than pranksters changing the signs, we were misdirected by churches, denominations, and other Christians. Most churches teach and preach as if the mystery had not been revealed. Most Christians think they are Israel, spiritual, physical or replacement, rather than the new creature, the body of Christ. If that weren't enough, we have noted that the very manner in which Bibles are printed is misleading. We must recognize that prophecy has been interrupted by the dispensation of the revelation of the mystery. The most important truth we must learn, prophecy versus mystery. Every endeavor, every hobby, every occupation has certain skill sets, certain requirements, certain parameters. That said, were you to ask, what is the most important thing I need to know, you would probably get an answer, but you could ask that same question of several people and probably get several different answers, depending upon whom you might have asked. If you asked a meat cutter in a grocery store, what is the most important thing I need to know to be a butcher, the novice might quickly say don't cut yourself. The apprentice might offer wear warm clothing because it is always cold in here. The seasoned professional might tell you where you put your knife determines the value and price of whatever you cut, so, think about what the customer wants with every move you make. All three gave correct answers, but the one you want working for you, the one you want training others, is the seasoned pro. Ask, what is the most important thing I need to know about Bible study? and you will get lots of right answers, but once again you would be wise to hear the seasoned professional. The Apostle Paul says for our learning and service to be approved of God, we must rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, that is not the answer you would get from a novice nor even an apprentice, and sadly, not even from many who have been around for a long time, but age and acumen do not always go hand in hand. Rightly dividing the differences between the mystery and the prophecy programs is the most important thing a Bible student can learn, but just making that statement is insufficient of itself. Here is proof. We must learn to recognize that there are two separate and distinct bodies of information in the Bible, separate programs identified as prophecy and mystery. That which is described as the prophecy program is that which was spoken by the mouth of all the prophets since the world began. Luke 1 verse 70 as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Acts 3 verse 21, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Separate and apart from what all the prophets spoke since the world began is the mystery information which none of the prophets spoke because the mystery had been hidden since the world began. Romans 16 verses 25 to 26, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Ephesians 3 verse 9, and to make all men see what the fellowship of the mystery is, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Clearly, that data which was spoken by all would have to be different and excluded from that data which was known by none. Most people have heard of the Old and New Testaments, but both of those were spoken of by the mouth of all the holy prophets, and so, both the Old and New Testaments must be included in the prophecy program. Jeremiah 31 verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah, Hebrews 8 verse 8, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The prophecy program is centered upon the Old Testament people Israel receiving their kingdom on this earth under the King of Kings. Revelation 11 verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord, and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. Unknown to the people of the prophecy program was that God would reveal a mystery by which God would create a new celestial one creature to operate in heavenly places too for his glory. 
While most everyone recognizes the existence of both the Old and New Testaments, hardly any recognize the presence of a third element, the mystery. This is perplexing since the Bible plainly declares that we are to make the mystery known, we are to preach Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and we are to be faithful stewards of the mystery. Doctrines Ephesians 3 verse 9, And to make all men see what the fellowship of the mystery is, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Romans 16 verse 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1, Let a man so account of us, as of the ministers of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Not only have most people missed the mystery, most have put on spiritual blinders by identifying themselves as New Testament Christians, a term which does not exist in the Bible and actually constitutes an oxymoron. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John contain much of the information by which these New Testament Christians strive to pattern themselves, apparently not knowing that they are actually attempting to conform with Old Testament Israel. Hebrews 9 verses 16 to 17, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Because of this, these New Testament Christians often pray for the furtherance of thy kingdom even though that kingdom was promised to Israel and is the centerpiece of the prophecy program. Matthew 25 verse 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Noting that the kingdom was prepared from the foundation of the world, we cannot help but note the similarity to the prophecy program and how it was spoken of by all the prophets since the world began. The mystery information was kept hidden since the world began, so, it can only be that it was kept secret and involves neither the Old nor the New Testaments. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto. Our glory, 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, Who hath saved us, and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, few things could be more different than rising to one's feet as opposed to falling to the floor, and the difference between prophecy and mystery is equally clear. The prophesied earthly kingdom program is all about Israel's rise, but during this time of the mystery, blessing come as a result of Israel's fall. Zechariah 8 verse 23, Thus, saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass, that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Genesis 12 verses 2 to 3, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Note the difference. Romans 11 verses 11 to 12, Through their false salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Romans 11 verse 15, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be, but life from the dead? The ramification of Israel's fall, diminishing and casting away is that, in Christ according to the mystery, Israel has no standing whatsoever. Romans 12 verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Romans 3 verse 22, Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all of them that believe, for there is no difference. Galatians 3 verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Since Christianity is according to the revelation of the mystery and since both the Old and New Testaments deal with Israel and that nation's prophesied kingdom, for one to call himself or herself a New Testament Christian is to butcher the word of truth rather than to rightly divide it. The most important things we can learn as we study the Bible are the differences between the prophecy and the mystery programs. 
The two-edged sword of the word of truth can do a lot of damage in the hands of the novice or the apprentice. The workman that needeth not to be ashamed will be the one who cuts straight, rightly dividing mystery from prophecy. 1. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 40 There are also celestial bodies, and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. 2. Ephesians 1 verse 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Colossians 1 verse 16 For by him were all things created, that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him, and for him. The Hebrew epistles, belong to the Hebrews. Before Peter, James, or John wrote anything, they met with Paul and Barnabas. At that meeting, in addition to setting aside the so-called Great Commissions found in the four Gospels, they determined that Peter, James, and John would confine their ministries to the circumcision. Galatians 2 verse 9, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. There is no need to appeal to commentaries or church tradition to discern the audience and intent of the Hebrew epistles. What is necessary is to realize that Israel is the recipient of the prophecy program, the covenants belong to Israel, and the Hebrew epistles are aimed at instructing Israel on how to endure until the end of the tribulation and to enter into Israel's millennial kingdom. Matthew 24 verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 24 verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. One might surmise that calling a book Hebrews would make it clear to all that the content would be to and about the Hebrew people. Perhaps many were led astray by Dr. C. I. Schofield's note that the book was written to Jewish Christians, one since we know from the 28th verse of Galatians chapter 3 that there is neither Jew nor Greek in the body of Christ, it is apparent that Schofield's note engenders confusion rather than clarity. That the book of Hebrews is not written to the body of Christ in this dispensation is clear when we note that the audience for the book is the same people who were present in the four Gospels and at Pentecost. Hebrews 2 verses 3 to 4, How shall we escape, if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will? Another easily discerned fact is that the book of Hebrews confirms God's new covenant promise to Israel almost exactly as God first stated it in the Old Covenant, Jeremiah 31 verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Hebrews 8 verse 8, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Problem passages in the book of Hebrews are easily understood when we realize the audience for the book is the Hebrew people either in the tribulation or in their new covenant. James is even easier. James 1 verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. While people debate which James wrote the book, it wouldn't matter if your name were James, and you wrote it last week, what matters is the doctrinal content and the audience to which the doctrine is directed. Not only do we know James was written to the twelve tribes of Israel, we know when because the tribes were scattered in Acts chapter 8, while Paul was yet Saul and the mystery was yet hidden. Acts 8 verse 1, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. With the mystery still hidden because Christ had not yet converted Saul to Paul and given the mystery to him, James talks about works and religion as you would expect a Hebrew to talk to Israel. Peter, having the keys to the kingdom since Matthew 16, having delivered the message on the day of Pentecost, writes two epistles to his people Israel. Were Peter talking to Gentiles, he could not say, 1 Peter 2 verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. 
And if that weren't enough, Peter speaks of salvation delivered at the second coming of Christ, exactly as he had done on the day of Pentecost. Point 2 1 Peter 1 verse 13, Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The three epistles of John all speak to commandment keeping and knowing the reader's relationship with God is acceptable based upon performance, hardly a message of grace through faith. The verses are too numerous to list, but here are some of the most salient examples. 1 John 2 verses 3 to 4, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 1 John 3 verse 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Ask the next person who claims the doctrines in John's Hebrew epistles how getting whatsoever they ask is working out for them. While these little letters have much to say on a spiritual level about love and fellowship, clearly the doctrine belongs to New Covenant Israel. In 2 John it remains the law program as given by the Father, not the grace program as given by Christ to Paul. 2 John 4 I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. The elect lady will be the Israel mine elect, three and since the focus is that which ye have heard from the beginning for it could not be that which shows up with the revelation of the mystery, Acts chapter 9 and after. Jude is an epistle given little attention by most people except for two or three verses used as slogans. Meanwhile, the book of Jude is replete with Old Testament references applied to Israel's New Testament promises. Note also that Jude deals with the words of the apostles in verse 17 and people who can fall in verse 24, hardly mystery truth, certainly not complete in Christ and sealed unto the day of redemption, 5. And finally, we come to the last of the Hebrew epistles, the book of Revelation, about which much more wrong has been taught than that which would be correct. Revelation is all about the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, the Great Tribulation. Clearly, the book of Revelation is prophecy and relates to Old Testament prophecy, most particularly Ezekiel and Daniel. That alone should be sufficient for us to realize Revelation would not contain mystery truth for the body of Christ, spiritualized preaching on the first three chapters notwithstanding. Trying to combine doctrine from the book of Revelation with Pauline truth is so painfully wrong that doing so has been the source of two cults, Seventh-day Adventism and the Worldwide Church of God. Both hold to Revelation's everlasting gospel which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12 17, 14 6. To make it as simple as possible, Revelation chapter 5 verse 10 identifies that this book of prophecy could not be intended as doctrine for those of us who are going to heaven. Revelation 5 verse 10, And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That revelation belongs to Israel is hard for many believers to accept because it is so exciting to think that we are seeing prophecy fulfilled in our lifetimes. Many see the difference between law and grace but resist accepting the difference between prophecy and mystery. Be that as it may, we must preach Christ according to the revelation of the mystery or be wrong, it is as simple as that. The Hebrew epistles then, explain to Israel the benefits of their Messiah's cross and help them to prepare for their time of tribulation and their kingdom on this earth. They make for interesting reading to be sure, and a good source for some spiritual truth and definition of terms, but they have no doctrinal application for the body of Christ, save when they agree with our Apostle, Paul. 1. Schofield Study Bible, Dr. C. I. Schofield, Oxford Publishing Company, page 1291-2. Acts 3 verse 19 Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. 3. Isaiah 45 verse 4 For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name, I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. 4. 2 John 6 And this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that, as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. 5. Colossians 2 verse 10 And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. 6. Ephesians 4 verse 30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. We obey the Lord Jesus Christ when we follow Paul. WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? was a very popular fad for a time, 
the thinking based upon Charles Sheldon's book in his steps, the theme of which being that to follow the Lord Jesus' life example is what it means to be a Christian. Not only is such thinking wrong in regard to salvation because it requires works rather than grace and faith, it is also wrong to think that we should follow the Lord when the Lord himself would have us to follow Paul and Pauline doctrine according to the revelation of the mystery. Jesus said, John 13 verse 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. We can make no mistake about it. The Lord Jesus Christ sent Paul just as certainly as Jehovah sent Moses. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, The things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Ephesians 3 verse 2, The dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, Lord. Acts 26 verse 16, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Romans 11 verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. 1 Timothy 1 verse 16, Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all longsuffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. When we take the attitude that the Bible is right and what we might have heard or might have thought must always submit to Bible truth, our belief system becomes a product of the Bible itself rather than what may have been said or thought about the Bible. Granted, it sounds wrong, even blasphemous to some, to say that we get our marching orders from Paul. Have you ever heard anyone suggest that Israel was wrong to follow Moses? Has anyone ever accused the Hebrew people of worshipping Moses? Of course not. This, however, is different and we would do well to understand the difference. Red letters in millions of Bibles wrongly elevated Jesus' words over the rest of the words in the Bible. We refer to ourselves as Christians and He is our Savior, so it is a very natural thing to desire to obey Him, and by common understanding it would seem a lessening of Christ's preeminence to follow Paul. To follow and obey the Lord Jesus while disregarding what the Lord Jesus said would be folly, but that is where most church-going people who call themselves Christian find themselves. First, the Lord tells Ananias in a vision that he has chosen Paul to go to the Gentiles, Acts 9 verse 15, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel. Even as Paul was being attacked and threatened by a mob in Jerusalem, Paul gives testimony to Christ's instructions. Acts 22 verse 21, And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Perhaps the most clear exposition and explanation of what Christ said to Paul in Acts chapter 9 is given 17 chapters later when Paul stands before Agrippa and describes his encounter with the Lord. Acts 26 verses 15 to 17 And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise, and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people, and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. Note also that Jesus promised to contact Paul subsequently and more than once when Christ told Paul to be alert to those things in the which I will appear unto thee in verse 16 above. This bit of detail helps us understand how Paul knew more mystery information later in his life than at the beginning, when Paul still thought as a child and saw through the glass darkly. The fact that Paul could say Christ sent me not to baptize one after Paul had been baptizing makes it evident that baptism was not a subject covered in Acts 9, but a subject clearly dealt with by the time Paul wrote his first Corinthian epistle. Paul declared that the Lord Jesus sent him to be a light unto the Gentiles, and if Paul is the Lord's choice, who are we to argue? Acts 13 verses 46 to 47, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. When our Bible gives us definition, we need not look elsewhere. Rather than trying to interpret and evaluate Bible verses using external sources, we would be wise if we evaluated everything else by our Bible. 
Many people pore over commentaries, and if you ask them what they are doing, they would tell you they are studying the Bible, in actuality they are reading books about the Bible, and that is not Bible study. Note the unambiguous definition the Bible gives us describing the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and then 8 verses later defining and describing Paul's ministry, Romans 15 verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises. Made unto the fathers, Romans 15 verse 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Christ, minister of the circumcision, Paul, minister of the Gentiles, exactly as Peter, James and John went to the circumcision and Paul to the Gentiles, Galatians 2 verse 7, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, Paul was the last to see the Lord Jesus, the first to get the message of long-suffering grace and the pattern to all of us who are believers, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 8, and last of all he was. Seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. 1 Timothy 1 verse 16, Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all longsuffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. The dispensation of the grace of God and the revelation of the mystery were committed to Paul by our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3 verse 2, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, Lord. Ephesians 3 verse 7, Whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Colossians 1 verses 25 to 26, Whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, since Peter, James, John, and the apostles of the four gospels had restricted their ministry to the circumcision. What they did and said would be consistent with what the Lord Jesus did and said during his earthly ministry with Paul and Barnabas. Going to the uncircumcision point two small wonder then, that the Lord delegated preaching the mystery to Paul, for were the Lord to preach the mystery himself, it would create conflicts and confusion with what had happened and been taught by the same Lord, according to prophecy in the four Gospels. Because Peter and the eleven apostles confined their ministries to the circumcision, Paul became the only teacher of the Gentiles, 1 Timothy 2 verse 7, whereunto I am ordained a preacher, and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ, and lie not winky face a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. 2 Timothy 1 verse 11, whereunto I am appointed a preacher, and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. When Paul began his life in Christ in Acts 9, Paul was separated unto the Gentiles as their sole minister. When Paul was near the end of his life on earth and ready to be offered, Paul still focused on his Gentile ministry, 2 Timothy 4 verse 17, Notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. We should not be any harder on others than we would be hard on ourselves for having missed or having rejected the importance of being Pauline in our doctrine. Millions who have gone before us and millions who will follow after us have been turned from Paul's writings by the error-prone traditions that permeate practicing Christianity. We are wise if we avoid the trap of making a career out of telling everyone what is wrong, better we show people the rightness of being Pauline with simple and clear verses, 2 Corinthians 4 verses 15 to 16, For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, If any man think himself to be a prophet, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Romans 16 verses 17 to 18, Now I beseech you. Brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. There are preachers that can get you so fired up you are ready to charge hell with a squirt gun full of gasoline. There are books you can read that grab your emotional handles and won't turn them loose. There are singers who can put tears in your eyes and musicians who can put a song in your heart. 
That being the case, we must discipline ourselves to be focused on Pauline doctrine and the preaching according to the revelation of the mystery. No matter how wonderful or convincing prophecy preaching and messianic messages may sound, we must never forget that those doctrines belong to Israel. Philippians 3 verses 17 to 19, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walks, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Sad to say, the enemies of the cross in the passage just above are the same people who are enemies of the gospel in Romans 3 Israel, the circumcision. And it follows as night follows day that even now those churchgoers who think they are Israel, the circumcision, the priesthood of believers, are enemies of the gospel of the grace of God. The grace of God. The grace of God by unmerited favor, unknown under the law. The grace of God apart from performance, unknown in the Gospels. The grace of God which had never been shown forth until Paul gave testimony, in due time point four. If the Lord Jesus Christ were to answer the question, what would Jesus do? The Lord would send you to Paul's writings and the revelation of the mystery, as though God did beseech you by us. 2 Corinthians 15 verse 19. 2 Timothy 1 verse 8 Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. 1. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17 For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. 2. Galatians 2 verse 9 And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. 3. Romans 11 verses 26 to 28 And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Shaun the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. 4. 1 Timothy 2 verse 6 Who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. Epilogue BMAD is the acronym for its title, Basics of Mid-Acts Dispensationalism. BMAD also works on some other levels. You should be mad, be mad, if you were never taught the concept of mid-acts dispensationalism before now. Whether you agree with the concepts or not, you should not have been kept in ignorance. You may be mad, be mad, now that you have learned what mid-acts dispensationalism is because it is so devastating to covenant and or denominational thinking. Should you teach mid-acts dispensationalism to others, those people might say, with apologies to Acts 26 verse 24, much learning doth make thee, be, mad. Winston Churchill once observed, men occasionally stumble over truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing happened. Generally speaking, when a person knowingly rejects truth, it is because truth hurts, and mid-acts dispensational truth would hurt income, position, reputation, or associations. Ultimately, we must each be fully persuaded in his own mind. Romans 14 verse 5. Just don't be mad. Rather, study to shew thyself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15.